No, sorry, trying to organize everything here on the screen. So, so lecture eight already. And today we talk about the death of stars and the synthesis of the heavy elements, what means everything beyond iron, nickel. Well, so we have some of the most violent events that are that can occur in our universe. Uh, supernovas, we have already seen type 1a supernovas, we're going to repeat them. And then today we have also type 2 supernova. Well, they are obviously necessary because a star breeds the chemical elements, but could life exist if this would all be then contained in the corpse of a star? They need to be redistributed, recycled into space. So all these chemical elements, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, whatever we need, even iron for our red blood cells. So it's good to have violent events that nicely distribute the stuff. And what you see here at the moment, this is basically, uh, this is a picture of Cassiopeia A. Cassiopeia A, well, if you look in the night sky, Polaris, so the pole, pole star, I think that must be Ursa Meyer. Then you go to Polaris, Polaster, Pole Star twice, and then you see Cassiopeia, this W. And there next to is this Cass A, if you have a good telescope. So what you see here, this is now a combined picture of the Chandra, so X-rays, Chandra te Space Telescope. So blue, green, this yellowish mostly. These are different elements, or uh, the X-rays of different elements. Sulfur, copper, uh, uh, not copper, sulfur was included. Silicon was included and up to iron. So, wow. Indeed, there must have come something on that released this into space. And well, there's also parts, it's orange ones mostly that are uh, visible. So if you just look at the visible, all we see is this bit of dust. With Chandra, we also see an X-ray source in the center of it. Is the remnant, the, the corpse of the dead star. And to give you a feeling, these are about 10 light years. This star exploded around 1680. There are a few reports, but it's not really super confirmed. So there might be that there was a gas cloud in between. It's 11,000 light years away, so basically in our quarter of the galaxy, of the Milky Way. And well, inside there is this radio and even uh, X-ray source occasionally, which turns out to be a neutron star. This was a type 2 supernova. And again, then we find up to iron, but I would have expected also to find a bit more up to uranium. You remember a star can burn up to iron, where we basically gain binding energy per nucleon and then multiplied with the nucleon, we gain a certain binding energy coming from one nucleus to another. But here it's then the maximum 56 iron or 62 nickel. And from there on we don't gain, we, we basically have to invest energy. Fusion doesn't work anymore. Fission does work to gain energy out. And there must be another uh, mechanism that explains us why we can find in nature, obviously not only up to iron nickel, that we also find heavier elements like germanium, strontium, uh, xenon, barium, platinum, gold in this region, and lead. And even beyond a bit, 
uranium and thorium. They are there. So somewhere there it must come from. This is again closely related to my playground or to the playground of us nuclear physicists. The table of isotopes. Last week we have looked at the, the low energy part here. So we plot here the neutrons and here we plot the, the protons. The chemical elements go basically in the y-axis and the x-axis along. We have what is called the different isotopes. One chemical element can have different uh, neutron numbers. Doesn't really play a big role for the atom, but for the nucleus it behaves completely different. One neutron added or removed. So the black ones are the stable ones. And by the way, I took this here from Timis, Schatz, Smith, Wischer, and Grefe. So from a publication from 2005. And they have then included different uh, processes to create the elements beyond iron. Iron is here, 56, this one. Then we have the nickels with 28. And obviously there is the stable nuclei found beyond even here, the uranium and thorium. And now you see here different processes, the S process, the R process. Meanwhile, there is an I process, which is S means low, R means rapid, and I means intermediate somewhere in between. And we find the RP process, the rapid proton capture process. So obviously we need to have loads of protons around. Here we need to have S process. And we see this is on the side where we have more neutrons. We need to have loads of neutrons around. Somewhere we need to get neutrons from. Hmm. Protons, of course, we have an every star. Then we have a P process. Well, the gamma process, this is when we have a source of very extreme hard light, then it might kick out a neutron or proton. Here's the gamma process. This is of lesser importance. Oh, so it's from 2005. I don't know, perhaps now we would have uh, different, different, uh, no, slightly different stuff. So there are loads of different processes that obviously contribute to different uh, uh, parts of this uh, nuclear landscape that then end up in producing us different chemical elements. Like here supernova, or P process, gamma process, but this would be a type one supernova. Here we see Cassiopeia A again. I think it's Cassiopeia, oh, it's a Kepler nova. Hmm. Another supernova a bit earlier, but also again type two nova here, type one nova. Different astrophysical scenarios that then result in different uh, processes to create the chemical elements. And today we look at them. Basically, we have no up to iron, and now we want to go beyond. Again, here would be classically written supernova or large stars. So there might be processes that still go on in stars and processes that we need the star to die. And last week we had already been the life cycle of stars. So basically we have our, oops, our gas cloud, star forming nebula, starving the protostars and then depending on how much material there is now accumulated to form the protostar. We might come to a mid-sized star, like our sun or smaller stars. This would be then a relative or burn along like, or the red dwarfs, Proxima Centauri in our neighborhood, which then at some point might have burned out their stuff, but it takes a while until they can burn out their stuff. While our sun will become this red giant and very likely what is called a planetary nebula. And at some point, 
just the remnant will be there of the core that hasn't been blasted into space and form a white dwarf, which then cools down and will become from the super hot white dwarf to very cold. And then if cold, its Planck spectrum is basically no longer indivisible. Therefore, it becomes black, a black dwarf. The absence of color is the definition of black. Of course, then we can have also a high master. You know, the speaker, or which then becomes a red supergiant at some point when it's in the very late, in the later burning stages, so away from the main sequence. And this red supergiant, and then we assume it explodes in this type two supernova. Here it's no written Kepler star. I think that's wrong. I think Kepler star was a type one supernova. Binary of low mass stars. Massive difference. And here it depends now on the on the temp, uh, on the mass of the star, what will happen. Black hole, neutron star. But certainly is uh, going to be around this, this type of nebula, like we have just seen in Cassiopeia. So this is basically the life cycles of stars. Okay, then let's start with low mass star. So less than eight solar mass, we would all call a low mass star. They might only be able to usually to burn up to neon and silicon, if at all, so eight solar masses, if you come closer. The less you have in mass, the less it pressure in the center, the lower the temperature, the lower the temperature, the lower the Boltzmann, like some Boltzmann distribution, the lower the gamma filter, the lower the reaction rates. And it can often not overcome this cooler wall that is there for the heavier elements because they have more protons. The higher cooler wall, they cannot overcome it. It can not enter later burning stages. So very, very essential thing. So, most of our stars that we observe cook on this uh, the main sequence, and then the low mass stars, so everything below eight solar masses will then go towards this giant branch. Uh, if you are too low in mass and hydrogen burning, that's it. They cannot enter the helium burning. Yet, when this happens, well, we have already seen last week, then triple alpha process we enter the helium burning phases. Oh. That means we now produce also much, much more energy. It's hotter in the core. Hotter means the gas expands and more energy is transferred also towards the surface. The outer layers, the outer layer heat up and the gas expands. The star expands. It becomes a red giant. We are now in the giant phase. Oh, that will at some point happen to our sun in roughly three and a half, four billion years. And yeah, of course, it depends on the model, but so it's very likely that we will uh, come, the sun will be as big as the Earth's orbit. So from 1 million kilometers to 150 million kilometers. I think one million kilometers is the diameter, so it, while the other is the radius, so it's 300 kilometers, 300 times as it is now, as big. What means here, at latest here, every life on Earth is gone, but probably already early. We could settle, of course, then over to Mars, but even Mars it might not be too nice. Of course, the surface temperature will be dropped because it becomes no red. The Planck spectrum turns more to come towards the red because the surface temperature is low. Well, then we have seen this is these later burning stages we have now. 
a self-controlled nuclear reactor which pulsates. Every time it produces more energy, it becomes hotter. It produces even more energy, but then the, the, the gas expands, the core, everything expands a bit, the core expands a bit. That means the particle number density drops and therefore the reaction rate drops. It becomes, if the reaction rate drops, the, the less energy produced, it becomes cooler. What means that the gas is now again contracting. It contracts, that means the gas heats up. The reaction rate kicks again a bit more in, produce more energy, everything becomes hotter, everything expands again. And if the core does so, of course, also the, 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 the by now, less dense, less bound surface of the star. So the, the outer shells, which are now from previously 1 million kilometers to 300 kilometers. A uh, million kilometers expanded, so the density is far less. And then, if you sweep from one to, to, to about 150 million kilometers, so half a million kilometer to the yeah, effect of 300, and then remember the gravitational force that is one over r squared. No, one over 300 squared. This is one over 100,000. So this stuff out at the surface is far, far less bound as well. So far less dense and far less bound. Okay, so now we have this constant uh, expansion and, and, and raising of the core. We get this C fate where we have stars. And obviously, luminosity. Remember, the luminosity was proportional to the, to the frequency, the standard candles. No, obviously, this is goes, the entire stuff goes faster for low mass stars and less fast. They're a bit more inert, the big ones. Okay. Yet, we have them on the very surface, this is less bound stuff, far less bound than unusual. And they made sequence. And then occasionally we might have like in a motor that runs out of fuel, and suddenly get some fuel and then makes a jump. So suddenly we might get here pressure waves that go out from the inner surface towards the outer, loosely bound surface layers, pressure wave that might lead to that outer shells are then eject ejected into space. The, the star loses material. Or it's so far away that it's basically no longer bound in the star. We have recycled some of these other uh, Hydrogen gas into space, what is not too bad. And we call what is forming a planetary nebula. Basically, some, some rest star surrounded by hydrogen gas, mostly hydrogen gas. Occasionally, there are some with a bit of helium gas. So, and they look quite beautiful. Of course, we have to be careful with the astronomers. Are these the real colors? Are these false colors? And so, so we have the really nice one, like the cat's eye nebula. Uh, that's the helix nebula, the cat's eye nebula. I think that's the ants nebula. So often, so these are the plan. And what this is the Eskimo nebula. I don't know what some people seem to see here from an anorak from a jacket of an es uh, Inuit, sorry, I think Eskimo is the racist term. And Inuit is the term that people uh, prefer by themselves, so should call this. But we see all these different shapes. And occasionally we see even that this must have happened in, in different uh, uh, phases. So it's not one big flash, that's then often called the helium flash. It's rather a continuous process where the star loses gas. 
This here would be then this helix nebula. And again, invisible, so basically you see mostly the gas that is here, reflection, and here, self -shining. Reflection means there must be somewhere a light source that we can't see. Or either it's too hot or too cold. If we take a look with the Spitzer Space Telescope in infrared, we see here this object inside. But you see here also these different rings. So a flash might have gone here, a flash might have gone there. Also, what we have to consider is, of course, that there is a rotation in the entire system. And it might be along the equator plane. It might be easier to, to extract mat uh, matter than towards the poles. But what we see here, there is a central object. It is obviously still hot. And of the problem is on our time scales, we don't really see it uh, uh, to cool down. We would have to look at 20,000 20, years again. Unfortunately, we are doing proper astronomy, maybe 200 years. We had, or well, let's say Kepler is the first Tycho Brahe Kepler, and it's five, 400, 500 years. Okay, I see this was now very European centered. The Chinese, which do it since at least 1000 uh, AD, the Arabs, then at this time, okay, we do it for 1200 years. So <clears throat> these are time scales, and unfortunately, the technology to measure these temperatures is not so old that we would really see a change. It's the process is hard to see. Well, interestingly, here this would be then the, the cat's eye nebula again, Hubble Space Telescope for the visible range, and Chandra. So the blue stuff, this is Chandra, this is X-rays, hard radiation. And here we nicely see, basically, I would say this is here one pressure front and here pressure front. So at least, and then maybe here a couple of, of these. So that this is rather a process that the outer layers get ejected. But it's very efficient. Most what you see in here, this stuff that is this uh, central star is the mostly seen by Chandra. Is 10,000 times as luminous as our sun. Sirius B, which is one of the, high, uh, the brightest stars that we can see, a couple of light years only away. Again, one of these types, stars that no longer burn, where we just have this hot core, because it has now evaporated the material, means also the pressure drops in the center, uh, the nuclear fire extinguishes. But of course, the object is still very, very hot. Very hot means it emits still a lot of light because of uh, this black body radiation. Well, so this central star turns out to be 10,000 times as luminous as our sun, but only it has only a solar radius of 0 0.65 in terms of diameter. Oh. So we often have then basically stripped the hot, very, very hot core of its surrounding, of these surrounding shells. <clears throat> and in the terms of the life cycle, what we can say, we have this Loma star, basically on the main sequence of brain meals, this main sequence is a bit hotter because it shines through the opaque so layers. And well, it still keeps on burning while the outer layers get accepted and the helium carbon, maybe oxygen, and if it's a bit heavier up to maybe silicon, if at all. Our sun, carbon, and maybe oxygen. Let's see, maybe rather carbon. Okay. So, 
it blows up and then basically it starts ejecting this outer, outer shells. That becomes, of course, then much more luminous because we see now the inner core. It cools down a bit, but then again, at some point, the, the next burn might be so cooled down that the density is so high that the temperature in the core, this very narrow region in the core, increases so much that the next burning stage can ignite. We produce for a short time loads of energy, but of course, and also the next outer layer is getting ejected. We can see deeper, it's getting hotter. And at some point, well, outer layers are gone. The core has exhausted its fuel. Stops burning. It just remains hot. And this, oh, with the stuff, then the, 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 the layers on this, the surrounding gas going away. It becomes brighter because now the gas does not scatter any light anymore away. But then, of course, it also starts at some point cooling down. And what we get after a quite a long time, we get what is called these white dwarfs. And if you remember how I introduced the, the Herzsprung Russell diagram. So oh, that is what uh, is going to happen to our sun. So when it loses, leaves the main sequence and then oh, becomes a planetary nebula, planetary nebula vanishes and the white dwarf is left. It glows for a while and at some point it leaves the, the white dwarf phase and dives here into Black now comes, of course, the questions, could this be contributed to black matter? I would say rather less, because if you think our sun will burn 10 billion years, the universe is certain that 7 billion years old, there cannot be too many, at least lighter than our sun, there cannot be too many corpses. In. If then of the heavier ones, there might be the corpses around, that have already become black dwarfs. But if we are above eight solar masses, the behavior, some people even say three solar masses, depends on the theory. The behavior of the dying star is much, much different. So, but here we are now relatively fine off, this is not too violent. And we can get different white dwarfs, depending how far the, the, the white dwarf could burn, how much uh, it could eject its stuff. So, so some have a nearly pure helium surface on a carbon and maybe oxygen core. Some have uh, even still a bit of hydrogen left ionized helium or uh, some have an exposed core of carbon hydrogen, uh, carbon and oxygen. Of, of course, there's also nitrogen and whatever you do that. Seen also, it was there also active. But why doesn't the stuff collapse? Because it's no longer burning. It's not producing energy. Nothing is really working towards the outside except this bit of a gas pressure. Why is this not collapsing towards the, to become a black hole? And it basically gravity contracts and contracts and contracts and there might be some limit where the gravity is so high because now the surface shrinks, one over R squared, the mass stays the same. So this is constant. But now divided by R squared, R squared becomes smaller and smaller. Therefore, it becomes bigger, 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 bigger. The gravity on the surface grows and grows until at some point. Oh, we might have even for light have problems to escape. And then we would have a black hole. So why is this not happening? Hmm. Hmm. And now it comes 
something in the game that is related to quantum mechanics. The Pauli principle. Some of you remember this perhaps from chemistry. Two electrons are loners. They don't want to be in the same quantum state, at least not in the same volume. There are, of course, electrons. If you have here a hydrogen atom, here a hydrogen atom, the electrons in this hydrogen sit in the ground state. They are in the same quantum state, but at different places. If we bring them together, that wouldn't work unless one of these electrons changes its sense of rotation. You remember this 21 centimeter line. And then they are in different quantum state because now the rotation is different. And then it can come close together and they can form. The two nuclei can be nearby and the electron can over be at the same volume, mostly between this positive charge nuclei. Oh, that was the chemical binding for beginners. <laughs> Sorry. But it wouldn't work if these two electrons are in the same quantum state as their spins, so the sense of rotations pointing in the same direction. And they are repulsive. Oh, now guess how much electrons we have in this uh, stuff. They don't want to be at the same place. Electrons are the low number. Electrons cannot be squeezed under a certain volume. By the way, this is the reason why we do not fall through the ground. Why your, your feet and socks do not merge, and the socks with the shoes, and the shoes with the ground. The electrons do not want to be too close to each other. And this leads to a pressure that works towards the outside. This is the so called. So these fermions, they cannot, not two of them can occupy the same state. And this leads to, they cannot be squeezed under a minimum volume. And this is the so-called degeneration pressure. That works, obviously, something you try to, but it doesn't want to be squeezed. It works towards the outside against this gravitational force. Oh, and that works for a while until the electrons say, that's too much. I don't want more. And they can, this gravitational pressure can work to gravity. This is related to approximately 1.4 times the solar mass. Underneath or above this mass, which is called the Chandrasekha mass, after Supramahayan, Manyan, Chandrasekha, uh, above this, the electrons say, Nah, I don't want to work anymore. I go now. The first electron says it goes on strike. And then all the other electrons still there, would have to do the extra work for this electron too. So the next one says, I'll go and strike. And then suddenly everybody goes and strike on them and then collapse. So this is the reason why under one point or why we need a certain mass or stars under certain mass just become white dwarfs. This degeneration pressure because obviously you need an inert core. But to burn this, you need to be in the center of something. You need the pressure. Stuff that you later get rid of via this uh, uh, planetary nebula. So, under over a certain mass, this is simply wow. Uh, under a certain masters, you will not reach this Chandra Seca mass. And then what you will have is the electrons will work forever against this gravitational pressure. And oh, you become a white dwarf and later black dwarf. But where does this limit come from? 
when the electrons say proof. By the way, this uh, Chandrasekhar mass, it was said that somebody recognized the outstanding talent of this young, young man who had a, not too much of a formal education. Then he got a stipend in Cambridge and then people put him on a ship which took them at this time from India to Suez Canal. Well, yeah, it looks as the Suez Canal was there. Mediterranean, then you arrive in Britain for a couple of weeks. And he used his couple of weeks to calculate this Chandra mass. That there must be a mass from this known, already known quantum mechanical principles. So and what is happening there? Well, we have seen that a neutron likes to become a proton because there's this 1.2 mega electron volt mass difference. Then we subtract the rest mass of the electron that we need to produce, so 0, 700 kilo electrons volts to the round left, and the anti-neutrino, the mass we don't care about. Okay, so that's why this decay happens. But now if the gravitational pressure exceeds basically the 700 kilo electron volts energy, force working along a wave, the force of pressure is, is force per, per area. If a certain area, we, we can calculate back to the force and then along the way, what means pressuring down. If this course force along this way corresponds to the 700 kilo electron volts or exceeds it, it becomes energetically favorable under these conditions for the electron to say, no, nah, I don't want to work towards the outside and keep this here stable. Yeah, it's too much. I seek refuge into a proton. Electron and proton merge to form a neutron. In this process becomes a neutrino free. Oh, the first electron does so, the next one does so. And then we get a chain reaction. So what is basically happening? If we exceed the Chandra Sekhar limit, electrons and protons are merging to form again neutrons. Remember, we had this massive problem. There were no neutrons around. But now there might be a mechanism to generate massive, massive amounts of neutrons. <laughs> of this 1.4 times solar mass become a neutron. Oh. But that's the Chandra Seca element. So usually, well, we start with a low mass star. Most of the mass has been ejected into space, form a planetary nebula. So for this below eight solar masses, we usually stay below, well below this Chandra Seca box. Our sun per definition, if it gets rid of all this stuff around, well, there's not much left in the burning core. Let it be half of its mass, so it's half a solar mass. Oh. <laughs> but of course, we don't want to have this stuff bound in black dwarfs. We want to have it nice again freely in space available as gas available to, to form a nebula and then from this nebula the next generation. So somehow that's in us, in, or at least it's inherent in me that I want to see the next generation flower or flowering and blossoming and, and develop the best, better than my generation. And my aim is that all you become better physicists than I am. This has to be mine. Well, I used to be a table tennis, playing table tennis, and at some point I was coaching, and at some point it happens that the boys that I taught to play table tennis, 
were starting to beat me. <laughs> Pissed me off. But then I talked to my coach, the guy that taught, taught me. And he said, you did a good job as a teacher. That's what I said to myself when you were starting to beat me. So this should be that one wants to see the next generation flowers. So one wants to have this stuff recycled into space. And then now it turns out to be good that most of the star systems are binaries. So we have these binaries. One star is a bit bigger, burns faster. And if it burns faster, it might some point even nick material from its companion. Who knows? Yet it burns faster, well, it becomes this red giant. The other might rather it donates material to the other because it expands now. And if it expands beyond what is called this wash lobe, so this common center of gravity, what will happen? Of course, the material will be nicked by the companion. Ah, I know quite practical, 70 to 80%. So the materials, the, the, the companion. So the hotter star becomes the red giant, the, the companion nicks the material. <clears throat> we develop here basically our white star, a uh, white dwarf without being becoming a planetary nebula, because now the companion is of course nicking the star. Now the companion becomes of course mass richer. It burns, starts burning faster, which is quite good. Because then at some point, so it is now a bit bigger companion, also becomes a red, red giant. And if it expands over this gravitational point where the gravity is stronger towards the white dwarf, the white dwarf will start making material. And if the white dwarf exceeds the Chandra Seca mass. The first electron says, I have not, I did enough. I did it, I did my share. That's enough. I don't want any more. Bye bye. And then the rest, the other ones, go quickly on strike and to have a thermonuclear explosion. All the type 1A supernova, uh, type 1 supernova. So we had this already, and since it's always the same Chandra Seca mass, it's a standard candle. Whoa. So the thermonuclear explosion goes through the entire stuff that is there. But there is no nothing left afterwards except these gas clouds. Obviously, there's also then loads of light produced and also very hard light. So X-rays, gamma rays, these are bursts. And what we create in these explosions is up to iron and maybe a bit beyond iron, but mostly iron. And there was a couple of years ago, the integral satellite basically has then looked at one of these. You remember the one with this terrible resolution, this gamma ray. And it has found there were gamma rays associated with the decay of 56 cobalt of 56 iron. So very likely there was 56 nickel generated decaying to 56 cobalt and then, which is after months, it's basically gone. But this month it might be so hot that if you look at it there's so much that you don't see anything. But then you look half a year later and then you see this decay of this cobalt to iron. And then you know, okay, no models weren't that bad because it's there what you expect. Sometimes it's good just to confirm. So, okay. Well, what sometimes of course happens is that on the surface you get locally such a density that you get locally such a, a heating that you have there a localized on the surface, a localized thermonuclear explosion, what means some, some hydrogen bomb going off, basically self-created. And all you get is uh, some hard radiation coming out. 
X-ray bursts, gamma ray bursts. But the real big thing is then starts when once the Chandrasekhar mass is reached. So this happens then all more down here and gives rise because we have now still a relatively proton rich these cores are not completely carbon or oxygen there is still a lot of protons around so rise to this p process or maybe even rapid p process examples for that kind of stuff one was observed by Tycho Brahe Supernova 1572. This is now again X uh, Chandra. There is no remnant. But what we have is the X rays of calcium, sulfur, silicon, iron, but not much beyond. So, oh, happened distance of eight to 10,000 light years away. Kepler seemingly observed one, and you remember Kepler had this uh, was not the, the best eyesight, like me basically blind, blindly going along. And Kepler has observed. So you see now this Kepler nova that is wrongly obviously in this uh, shots and whatever we shall figure from the beginning. Again, this Chandra, then yellow is Hubble, and red is the Spitzer Space Telescope. So optical infrared and x-rays combined so you wouldn't see this picture the way it is and kepler has observed one. even uh, queen elizabeth the first asked uh, where is this star or oh, what what is this now this new star it was then visible for about a, a month or so well, again loads of x-rays from stuff up to iron, but no, no remnant. So it's really just guess. Everything has been exploded. Well, and then this, we have seen this type 1a supernovas nowadays. Uh, <laughs> well, just in one year, more than 100, quite frequent. But of course, this is in the entire universe. What is less frequent is than this type two supernova. So entire white dwarf is ripped apart. We have the same amount of material that is going. All the stuff is recycled nicely into space as we wanted. And then you remember these light curves. We can renormalize them and we get basically them as these standard candles. But there was this outcome, if you remember, that uh, this re-accelerated expansion. And there is no this thing. Supernovas that happen now might be already second or third generation stars. And the chemical composition of these stars might be different. Because, and this is now crucial because in the Chandrasekhar mass, we have the ratio of the proton to mass number. Mass number is proton plus neutron. So proton to neutron ratio. That might be now a bit shifted to less. That means this, there would be less stuff exploding. We would now think this is too bright. things that are ongoing in the discussion. So five to 10 years, the discussion might have settled and we might have come to an agreement, who knows? So just to, to keep you cautious. So light stars up to iron, maybe nickel. Above, we need a different type of reaction. So the fusion doesn't work. So even in these explosions, what we have is fusion. I don't know go to become bigger ones. Driven by this collapse and then really the nuclei that are still around, which the neutrons didn't convert, 
they have become, you know, they nicely merge in this collapse, in this thermonuclear explosion. The next needs, of course, different reactions. And this is then in the next video, because now I see it's time to soon to pick up my boy. Okay. See you for the next video. And I think that's long enough for one video, 50 minutes. Okay.